Y season four, episode four, ML Ops, speeding up and managing your ML models. This will be presented by uh, Damien Brady today from Microsoft, who's a uh, cloud advocate. So it's gonna be a fantastic session today. Uh, for anyone that's missed uh, the previous sessions, they're currently all on YouTube. Um, last week we had cutting edge Azure Sphere IoT acceleration. Um, it's a great session. I, it's just been loaded up on YouTube this morning. Um, this, of course, is the ML Ops. Next week we have the rapid development on the Power Platform Zero to Hero. Uh, so make sure you. Um, tune in for next week as well. Um, this session's unfortunately going to be cut short a little bit. So these last three sessions are going to be uh, rolled on to the uh, next season. So just look at look out for some updates. So this season will finish on the 24th of June. And if you haven't signed up for any of these sessions that are left, feel free to scan uh, the QR code at the top and you can register for them. Loving QR codes today, because if you haven't signed up for our LinkedIn uh, pro community, please uh, sign up there as well, and you can look for more updates for the next season. And a little bit of housekeeping, like all weeks, this session is recorded and will be shared on LinkedIn and YouTube, mostly YouTube, but we'll eventually be popping up on LinkedIn as well. Uh, please ask questions and feel free uh, throughout the session to ask them. You should see a Q and an Q&A tab at the top. Um, we'll try and answer a few of those as we go, but this session is very uh, specific, so most of the questions will probably end up with Damien at the end. So he'll try and keep around 10 minutes, probably a little, little bit less just for question time at the end. So please chuck in your questions about how you're deploying your ML models. A little bit on the Azure announcement side, uh, PowerShell support in Durable Functions is now general, uh, generally available, which is fantastic. For anyone that doesn't know, Durable Functions, uh, when you're talking about serverless, uh, Functions is generally the way to go with uh, Azure, and Durable is when you're using st uh, stateful, stateful serverless workflows. Event Hub Premium is now available in public preview. This is for multi-tenant offerings with resource isolation and has a bunch of higher limits and a lot of support for uh, Kafka. And something that's been a really big ask is now I'm glad to announce public preview, native support for WebSockets for APIs in Azure API management, which is uh, something that we've got a lot of asks about. It's now available in all tiers, except for the com consumption tier worldwide. Uh, so please take a look at that. Uh, if you wanna check out some more updates, feel free to scan the QR code down the bottom, and that gives you a full list of all the current updates that are happening um, on Azure. And now I'll hand over to Damien. Hi, everybody. So uh, I am gonna quickly just share my screen so you can all see what I'm gonna be talking about. All right. Thanks as well for everybody, uh, to everybody for um, for joining me here. There we go. Got rid of the little thing. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna be talking today about ML Ops or DevOps for Machine Learning. So I like calling it DevOps for Machine Learning, um, but ML Ops is kind of the the term that the industry has landed on. So. I'm not going to change anyone's mind there, but you'll see why I call it DevOps for machine learning rather than you know, ML Ops specifically. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk a bit about Azure machine learning specifically as well and how, how it can help, um, plus some of the other tools that we have in, at our disposal too. So um, a bit of background on me. I'm a cloud advocate, as Peter said. Um, I'm focused on DevOps and ML Ops. And so ML Ops is a bit more recent for me. I've been a dev, like a paid programmer for about 20 years, uh, a little bit longer than that. And uh, in that time, I, you know, I finished university. I basically went, started doing VB Classic and then .NET um, after it, or before it became .NET 1 and things like that. So I've always been a traditional software developer, you know, somebody who understands how the problem works and then writes the code to solve that problem. I remember when I was at uni though, I got a little bit of exposure to machine learning, but I didn't quite understand what it was and it kind of drifted away from me. When I started working at Microsoft as a cloud advocate, I had the advantage of working with a lot of really smart people in this field. And one of them who you may recognize, uh, Seth Juarez, he's um, very big in Channel 9, but he's also uh, got a lot of training and a lot of uh, qualifications and things in machine learning. He's also a magnificent pro, uh, communicator. 
and he explained to me basically what machine learning was. So just to make sure we're all kind of in the same ballpark and to set that scene of why I like to call it DevOps for machine learning, um, let's talk about what machine learning actually is. So traditional programming, I understand the problem, I write an algorithm to solve that problem. When I give that algorithm some data, then I get a result at the other end. I get an answer at the other end. Now, this is good for problems where you understand how to solve that problem. So uh, as an example, let's say I'm asked to write a function that uh, tells me how much tax is applicable for a particular transaction, right? So I would know how to solve that. I look up tax tables. I would uh, look at what type of transaction it is. Is there GST applicable to it? Things like that. But I'd, I'd know how that algorithm looks, like the if statements, the loops, all that kind of stuff. So as a traditional programmer, I would write that code and then it, it would work like this. We'd feed in some kind of details about the transaction and that function would return an answer. But machine learning works a different way. Now, machine learning is really good for those problems where it's not so clear what the algorithm should look like. So uh, it might be something like, if we lend this person money, what's the likelihood that they're going to repay it on time? So that is a little bit more difficult to work out, you know, how do I tell whether this person's going to repay the loan? And so the way we solve that with machine learning is we switch this idea around where we provide a whole lot of previous data or a whole lot of sample data or existing data and the answers to those uh, to those questions. So in this case, a ton of previous loans, some details about the people who took out those loans and the demographics and things like that, and then whether they repaid the loan on time and then we let the computer build this algorithm to kind of match those answers to the data that we've given it. Now, that algorithm is called a model. We're basically modeling how the answers map to that data. And so the great thing about this is this model can really be substituted for that function that I would have written if I'd known how that, how that function worked. Now, that's ultimately all we're talking about. And you'll notice here I'm talking about a model and you know predictions and things like that. It, that's a really important part. The fact that we are getting predictions, not answers, is, is really significant. It's dependent on how good our data is, how good our training is, um, how well we've tuned that, that predictive model and things like that. Now, if we're not considering how we actually get from this idea all the way through to a predictive model, um, it's and if we're not trying to um, optimize that process of you know tuning this model, providing new better data, and getting a predictive model at the other side, then it gets really difficult to kind of mature that process of of improving the value that we're giving to the people using our predictive model. So we talk about the process of software development a lot, um, especially in DevOps, but we don't really talk about the process for machine learning projects. And part of it is because it's still a you know, comparatively new uh, kind of area. Um, it, if you look at software development, it's been around for a very, very long time. Machine learning kind of has too, but it's only in recent years that the scale of the data and the power of the processing has become accessible to everybody so that this uh, machine learning stuff has started working its way into more and more applications. So we hadn't needed to think too much about the process of actually generating these models and, and getting a good process out for putting them in production. So the machine learning process um, is still pretty generally uh, similar for no matter what kind of um, process or not, no matter what kind of model you're producing. There's this general idea of preparing the data that you're going to train on, then using uh, different types of training um, methods and algorithms and things to train a predictive model. And then when you get that model, evaluating how accurate it is or how accu accurate you think it is, and then going through a loop, going back to the drawing board and trying to improve by improving the quality of the data. And by the way, that's the hardest part, but we don't ever talk about that, which is um, because it's it's not terribly exciting. So preparing the data to get a better result out or preparing or you know improving the way that we train our model, changing what algorithms we're using, changing hyperparameters, um, scaling up so we train for longer, things like that. Ultimately, though, no matter what you're doing, you're going to end up with a model that hopefully at one point you think, right, we're going to put this in production. Now, Putting that in production brings us back to this traditional software development problem we always had where the developers would create an application and then just kind of throw it over a wall to the operations teams to put in production somehow. And the same thing happens here. We end up with this predictive model 
and we're told, right, uh, just put this in production somehow, somewhere, embed it in the application, or I don't know, maybe it needs to be a service or something like that. Because the reality is that data scientists and machine learning experts aren't usually programmers. They're certainly not um, operations team um, team members a lot of the time as well. So this throwing it over the wall that DevOps is supposed to deal with can absolutely apply to machine learning to improve that process too. The other side of it is a lot of the work that happens with machine learning happens on a data scientist's machine, or at least on the cloud, um, but triggered by you know code that they're writing on their machine. But then the production deployments uh, quite often and collaboration quite often happens by passing around a USB key or emailing things. Um, this is the way we maybe used to do it in small teams in software development, but we don't do that anymore. Unfortunately, it's still kind of a, a common thing in machine learning projects. Now, if you compare that to DevOps, which we've been talking about for quite a while and I talk about all the time, where we have this cycle of planning your work, developing and testing the code, uh, releasing that product to test sites and then to production and then monitoring what's happening in production, feeding that back into your planning process and doing this as fast as possible over and over again, as fast as possible, as automated as possible and as safely as possible. This gives us a great way of kind of focusing on just what our real jobs are. So the developers can just focus on writing code and know that the process is going to put it in production. We're going to see if there's anything wrong. We can plan our work more effectively because we're watching what's happening in production. So what we really want is something similar for machine learning projects. We want a way for data scientists to just kind of focus on getting a better predictive model out, collaborating effectively with the rest of their teams, uh, automating our training runs, deploying in a nice automated safe way, monitoring the, uh, the uh, what happens in production, the accuracy of those predictive models, and then feeding that back into our planning as well. So we have this cycle that allows our data scientists and machine learning experts to focus on what they want to focus on. So just quickly, just to kind of um, tie this all the way back to that comment I made at the start that I like calling it DevOps for machine learning. This is Microsoft's definition of DevOps. It's the union of people, process and products to enable continuous delivery of value to our end users. Now, I didn't change this for this talk or anything like that. This is the definition that Microsoft uses for DevOps. And I've highlighted the most important word, though, which is value. Right. The idea is to provide value to your end users on a continuous basis and to work uh, using products and process and all of the people involved to to that end. Now, with traditional software development, you might think of value as new features, bug fixes, uh, improved availability and scalability and things like that. In machine learning, value is most likely um, mainly going to be decided by the accuracy of your predictive model. So if you if your data scientists have managed to improve the accuracy of your model without impacting performance and things like that, the idea behind DevOps would be to put that value in the hands of your end users as quickly as possible, not waiting until somebody works out how to put it in production, but continually delivering that value. So this definition does not need to change for machine learning. We're still providing value and we're still trying to do it on a continuous basis. So that's why I like calling it DevOps for machine learning. It's just DevOps. It's the same definition. It's the same aims. It's just that we're working with predictive models instead of traditional software. All right. So um, I would be remiss if I didn't start talking about um, the Microsoft products that kind of help help this. And we'll talk about a couple of others as well. But the main one I want to talk about is Azure Machine Learning. So this is a product that's been around in a few forms uh, for quite a while. It's getting extremely stable and it's been quite powerful and quite um, uh, amazing for quite some time. I, normally I would kind of walk through what it looks like with screenshots and things, but um, I know in this group people kind of prefer little demos. So this is the Azure Machine Learning um, portal that we've got here. You can get to it by going to ml.azure.com uh, and then making sure you've got the right subscription and things like that. And this is your UI. You've basically got all of these things down the left uh, and we've got a dashboard here as well. So I'm going to walk through some of these um, some of these just to let you know what Azure Machine Learning can actually do for you to improve this. And remember, our aim is to kind of get this process to get our predictive models trained better in production and this collaboration happening between people. Now, I'll come back to some of the authoring stuff. Um, hosted notebooks is a fantastic way, um, way of actually authoring uh, your things. Um, so you don't need to have uh, Jupyter notebooks being passed around by, you know, on files and things like that. You can host them um, in the cloud. Automated ML 
could be a five day long session by itself. It is an amazing way of kind of shortcutting a lot of the, the busy work of, um, you know, deciding what the correct algorithm is, um, running parallel training runs. Uh, it, it actually does some really cool stuff like users machine learning to work out what the best machine learning algorithm is. So it will in parallel run a whole lot of different runs, compare the results from each based on whatever metrics you choose and pick and choose the right algorithms and then give you a starting point saying for this problem, the most accurate and most um, valuable uh, predictive model uh, is produced by using this technique. It's, it's amazing, incredible stuff, um, but that could be a talk on its own. So I'm actually going to skip that one for this one. The designer is also quite cool and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, it's it lets you build these models um, in a really, really easy way. This assets part is kind of what I would really want to talk about. Um, this is kind of the core building blocks of what Azure Machine Learning can manage for you. So data sets are registered known data sets, and we'll talk about these a little bit later. Um, but uh, Azure Machine Learning allows you to create these data sets from a bunch of different places. The great version, uh, the great idea behind this is that you can version these as well. So if you have a bunch of images, for example, of your products, you can have a model trained on a particular version of those product images. And then when you add more products, you can have a separate version and train based on that version. You get that traceability of, here's the model I produced based on the experiment, based on the version of the data. Uh, really good for being able to manage that stuff. Um, you can also create them from data stores. So um, either file-based or data uh, or tabular-based. I'm just gonna choose tabular just to show you what's available here. Um, if I create a new data store, you can see there's a bunch of different things that I can create it from. So I can pull from an Azure file share, blob storage, data lake, um, a SQL database, um, Postgres as well. So you can get your data from where it already kind of exists in the cloud. The really powerful thing about these data sets is when you're doing your training using the Azure um, Azure Machine Learning SDK, you can just mount these or it, it just mounts these as kind of drives that are available to you, which really, really speeds up the training process. Um, it's incredibly fast once you do this, this kind of thing. All right, so those are the known data sets versioned as well. Um, we have our experiments as well. So um, I have a couple of experiments. We'll talk about car price in a second, but I'm just using an MNIST, which is like your machine learning, hello world. Um, so I did a, a few runs of that and you can drill into it and see, you know, I've done eight runs um, two of them failed, six of them are completed. You can see the accuracy charted between the different versions. Uh, you can scroll down and see what compute I used, how accurate it was, any tags, the actual details of the run, so you can actually get the full logs and the metrics of each run um, and when it was run and things like that. Uh, any images, monitoring, there's some previews of things like explanations to tell you how the model was produced. Uh, the end model was produced, which features were were beneficial and which ones weren't. Fairness is is a, is this uh, ethical AI um, efforts that Microsoft is going to as well. So to make sure that it's actually um, you know a, a fair or kind of ethical build of a um, predictive model. I'll be honest and say that I don't know a great deal about this. You can see I haven't actually included any of those metrics. Um, and then monitoring as well. So you can actually monitor. Um, the resources as well to see what's happening when they're actually being used. All right, so that's that's experiments. Um, modules as well uh, is a is a really new thing. This kind of lets you share pieces of code um, between your teams um, from GitHub, Azure DevOps, um, or some other places like that. So you can create links to um, uh, to these things as well from here. Pipelines uh, is a great way of actually having what you consider a CI kind of pipeline. So a build pipeline of, of tasks of things that you need to do to actually train your model. I've got a couple here. You can also use them um, with endpoints. So hit an, a rest endpoint to kick off a pipeline um, to say, okay, I want, I want you to run this entire training run. And then we have drafts and things like that as well. The models are kind of what comes from these experiments. So you can see I've got a bunch of these MNIST uh, models here that have been produced by those runs, which were experiments as well. So this predictive model came from this run of a particular experiment, which used a particular data set and some compute and so on. So again, all this traceability all the way through from the model all the way through to the to the code that it came from. Uh, and then finally endpoints as well. Um, there's actually a really cool uh, new feature as a build. 
uh, called managed endpoints. So what you can do is, um, I'm just gonna put some random text in there, but you can choose a model and then um, based on that model, um, deploy it using, um, sorry, I think I skipped it, using a managed compute type. So what this is, is kind of your true serverless brought to machine learning. So you have this predictive model that you've created and you're telling Azure to deal with all of the infrastructure that it needs to run um, itself. You don't need to manage the machines that it runs on when it's doing its, its live inferencing and things like that. Or of course you can deploy to AKS if you want something that's a little bit more controlled scalable as well. So managed endpoints make things a lot easier if you don't wanna to have to worry about worry about them, you know, where they run and things like that. Okay, so those endpoints exist. And again, there's another source for the pipeline endpoints if you wanna kick off a pipeline too. Um, just really quickly, there's a few things in here uh, in the manage. So managing compute, uh, you get compute instances for, um, you know, running Jupyter, so the Jupyter notebooks. You can even run VS Code on these managed machines as well, R Studio or a terminal. Um, you can change the size of these machines. Um, the best thing as well is you can start and stop them. So you're only using them when you need. Compute clusters are great for training as well. So for example, uh, let's see, I think this one is the one that I'm using. You can see that at the moment, there's no nodes being used. So I'm not being charged for this at all, but it will scale up to four if I need to. So if I wanna do a training run that can run in parallel on four different compute nodes and I wanna do it as fast as possible, this will, um, this will scale up to four nodes. There's a GPU in each of them, um, you know, six cores, 56 gig of RAM, things like that. But the great thing is I'm not being charged for this right now because it's not being used. So these compute clusters can be really, really handy for controlling, you know, your spend on these things as well. Inference clusters are very similar. Um, basically a cluster for when your model is in production and it's being used for inferencing. And then you can also attach um, other compute engines or other compute um, uh, resources as well to do some more work if you want. Um, environments is also quite cool. It is, um, it's new as well, it's pretty new. Uh, and it is a way of defining the environment that your uh, training run will run on or your, um, your compute will run on. So your inferencing, your production inferencing will run on. And there's a whole lot that Microsoft created. So there's ones that are, you know, running Python 3.8 on a Triton server with CUDA. Um, and so you can say when you want to deploy um, or when you want to train, hey, just use this environment here, this Triton server or a PyTorch server or an Onyx runtime for doing your inferencing and things like that. So this is really cool and you can create your own custom ones if you need your own resources on them too. Uh, data source is kind of similar to data sets, but a lot more raw. It's basically just that raw connection to blob storage and file share. They kind of work in tandem. Um, data labeling is really, really handy for labeling data sets at scale. Um, so really handy for providing that training data that you're going to be training your models onto. So there are some great tools in here. Um, and then linked services. Again, I don't know a great deal about this, but this allows you to connect to things like Synapse, um, right from Azure Machine Learning. So you have that integration point as well. So yes, lots and lots of stuff in Azure Machine Learning. The key here though is that this is really a product that is designed to manage that workflow, that idea of we have some code, we're gonna kick off an experiment based on that code. We have some data that we're training on and we're gonna use those together using managed compute. Um, and then when we get a predictive model at the other end, we can kick off a managed endpoint to basically create that and run it in production. Now, all of this is available as well by um, an API or by an SDK or a CLI tool as well. So a command line interface tool, which means that you can automate this stuff using any of your standard kind of DevOps tools, GitHub Actions, Azure pipelines and things like that. So look, we'll come back to the, some of this stuff in a second. Um, I just wanna talk about what uh, so when we're talking about these demos, this is what I would generally consider a full kind of end-to-end -end pipeline. There's obviously going to be a lot more detail in this um, when you actually go to implement it, but there's data preparation, there's training, and then at the end, when you get this model at the other end, you want to register that model. We saw in Azure Machine Learning, we have these versioned models. We can tell what experiments they came from. And of course, on the way, we're using data sets, we're using compute and things like that. So let's talk a little bit more about DevOps and I'm, I'm glancing down at the questions. I can see we don't have any at the moment, so I'm gonna take that as, um, 
uh, an assumption that I'm explaining things incredibly well. Um, it's always better for my ego than than any other explanation. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of those standard DevOps things. So let's talk about collaboration. Now, one of the things that um, I, I showed you really briefly um, to do with um, Azure Machine Learning was this designer. So I want to drill into that designer a little bit more. Let's just click into here and you can see that I have a few um, of these pipelines. So I have a training pipeline and I have a real-time inferencing pipeline. So I'm just going to choose the car price one. Now this is one I put together in maybe uh, probably took me about an hour in total and I'm not a machine learning expert by any stretch. Um, I knew enough to kind of know what things were called. So you can see here I kind of just dragged and dropped these these items from over here so we can have some data sets and of course these come from wherever your data sets come from. Um, some sample ones, data transformation tools, feature selection tools, machine learning algorithms. So in this case I'm using a decision forest regression in mine. Um, and so as long as I know what these things are called, I don't have to really write any code for it. Um, so I'm grabbing that data, I'm selecting certain columns because not all of them I think are relevant. I'm splitting that data into training and scoring, I'm summarizing it over here just so I can see what it looks like. Um, and then I'm using a, this decision forest regression to train my model and then I get this model at the other end. So I kind of just dragged and dropped this stuff and set a few settings and things like that. What's really cool about this though is that if I um, go to outputs, you can see this. So I've just clicked on the score model. So this is right at the end, this score data set. I can have a look at what that actually looks like. So this is my one that I put together in about an hour and you can see here's all the columns of the data that I thought was relevant for the price of a car, which is what this is trying to predict, the price of the car given this the, these bits of information. And so this graph represents you know, the, the spread of the price, the car prices. And this is my predictive model, my scored labels. And you can see, I mean, I don't know whether I want to put that in production yet, but just as a result of dragging and dropping and not really doing much, you can see I've got kind of a reasonable result here. So I've got this starting point. I know that my um, was a decision tree or decision forest tree thing. That looks like it might might work. I might need to do a bit of tuning. So this gives me a great starting point. The problem comes when I want to share this with my team or somebody else in my team has a good idea about how they could, you know, filter this data or um, translate that data to get a better result. Now, how am I going to work with somebody else with this? This isn't in source control. This is just a, a designer. It's great for kind of proof of concept or just trying things out, but it's not very good for collaboration. And that's a problem when it comes to DevOps and repeatability and things like that. Now, um, don't get me wrong, great tool, but if we're talking from a DevOps perspective, this is probably not the way to go. What we really want to do is make sure that we're doing so some standard kind of DevOps practices. So source control is the first one. We want to make sure that we put our code in source control. Uh, there was a question just uh, I'm looking at as well about the quality of the data set. Any general rules that need to be followed, e.g. size of historical data sample or uh, DQ is based on uh, what the model will predict. Yeah, I would say that that second part, the quality of the predictive model is going to depend very much on um, your domain. So if you have an incredibly easily predictable kind of domain, so car price, for example, um, I don't know how many columns, sorry, how many um, actual pieces of data there are in here. Actually, maybe I can find that out. Let's just have a quick look. Outputs, data set output. Um, the raw visualization, there's only 205 rows in this, right? And I still got a reasonable result. Now, if you're looking at, um, is somebody going to be able to repay a loan and you're using 200, 200 rows and you have, you know, 50 columns that are probably relevant to that decision, you're not going to get a great result, you know, from 200 rows. You might need thousands of rows. Ultimately, the proof is in what happens in production. How accurately are you predicting? The real world. Um, in general, as long as the data is relatively representative of what the real world looks like, um, more is better. So more quality data is always going to give you, or usually going to give you a better result. Um, yeah, the if you have a lot more data but it's all over the place, there's a lot of outliers, it's not very clean, that's not going to give you a better result as well. So the, the general rule for historical data would be um, 
it should be as close to production as possible. So looking at car prices from a data set 50 years ago is not going to give you a good result. Um, so quality um, similar to production and volume. The more you can get that is quality data, the better result you're probably going to get. But beyond that, there's really not much um, that is a, a you know golden rule or, or anything like that. I hope that helps a little bit. Um, so let's talk briefly about uh, source control. So uh, this is the logo for Git, and I put that in there because Git has pretty much won the source control um, world. If you're using something else, um, perfectly fine, but Git is kind of the, the way that most people talk about source control these days. Um, the number one thing I would say is that what should go in source control is all of your code and your comments for writing that code. Um, if you've used notebooks, Jupyter notebooks and things like that, you'll know that Jupyter works by having both the input cells, so the, the data that does the work, and the output. So if you want to draw a graph, for example, that graph will be part of that Jupyter file once you've run that cell. So you're kind of combining the input and the output. Um, if you have the output in your Jupyter files and you commit them to source, um, then you're likely to have a lot of collision problems, so um, merge problems, because the outlook might look different on my machine than it does on somebody else's machine, but the input, the bit that does the work, is exactly the same. Um, I don't want to have to deal with merge conflicts with output. Um, there's some actually some really good Jupyter extensions for Visual Studio Code, if that's the tool you're using, that can really help with that kind of thing. Um, I check it out. Uh, the, yeah, Jupyter Notebooks extension for um, for Visual Studio Code is is fantastic. But the key here is you want the, all of the code that that kind of produces your model. So whether that's Python or R, it's best to have them in their own files and use Jupyter or something like that or notebooks in general to kind of experiment and to observe that data, have a look at what it looks like. So you want the code and some comments, sure. But you also want all of the pipeline, the way that you train your code, the way that you filter your data, um, and even things like um, the way you version your models and, and register your models. You also want the infrastructure and all the dependencies that you need. So we looked at environments before really briefly. You want to be able to define that environment that you're training on. Um, versions of Python, versions of PyTorch, versions of TensorFlow, whatever you're using to do the training, you want to define that in source control so that when somebody else picks it up, they don't just have the code that you use to train, they have everything they need to know how to produce a model at the other end. Now, this is very similar to your traditional software development. You have infrastructure as code, you want, and um, pipeline as code as well. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got a little bit of a cough. I was, I've been holding that off. I, I lasted quite a while. Um, so you want all of the stuff that, that you need for somebody to be able to pick it up fresh and start running with it. Um, one more thing I would say is that you probably want maybe just a little subset of data, but you certainly don't want all of your training data in source control. Um, Git is wonderful, but it is certainly not wonderful for a terabyte of data, right? It is good for your code. It's not great for, for data. And there are some tools that can help with this. Azure Machine Learning, as we saw, can version your data sets. So if you have um, an easy way of separating those data sets, so files in different folders and things like that, um, it can version them for you. <coughs> There's also some other tools like uh, DVC, Data Version Control. Um, Pachyderm is a great product. There's a whole bunch of them as well to help you version your data, but don't put that data in Git. If you really want to, uh, put some small subset in so that you can um, you know, try things out without having to connect to data databases and things. The key here though is that everything should be in source control except your training data. That should be a known shared data source in Azure Machine Learning or, or elsewhere. Um, let's talk about continuous integration or CI. Now I tend to use this, uh, I tend to use GitHub Actions for this. So when I change my training code, which remember is just in a Python file, not a notebook, um, because I don't want that output. So when I change my code, it kicks off a GitHub action, which will, <coughs> excuse me, this is gonna keep happening, I'm afraid. Um, it's gonna refresh my Azure Machine Learning pipeline. So that pipeline we were talking about of um, parsing the data, uh, running my training, and then creating a model at the other end. It will refresh that in Azure Machine Learning and kick that off. And the reason I don't wanna do that training in GitHub Actions is it might be using a terabyte of data, five GPUs, and might still take a day, right? 
GitHub Actions is not built for that. Um, none of the standard DevOps tools are really built for that, but Azure Machine Learning is. So we'll let Azure Machine Learning do that work. Um, the great thing about doing this, uh, this continuous integration in GitHub Actions or a similar tool is that you get um, the ability to check the quality of your code like you would with all of your other code. You can do linting to make sure that your variables are named nicely and your functions are named nicely and things like that. You can run unit tests. You can also do the whole idea of pull requests and things like that as well. So you don't want everybody committing all of their changes straight to your main branch and then kicking off a $10,000 training run if, you, if you know, you're at that scale. A pull request process will allow you to check these things before that code ever hits your main branch. You could even do a limited, um, a limited power kind of training run just to prove some things out and make sure it's it's not going to, you know, just burn time and not give you a good result. So that pull request process uh, is available to you as well if you use these standard tools and you have your code in Git. Um, the key here though is that the code quality matters. So what we're actually producing is a predictive model, yes, but the quality of the code and the quality of the way that we produce that model um, definitely matters. Right, so uh, let's look at, talk about the next bit. So CI, CD is what we normally talk about, continuous deployment or continuous delivery. So we've got CI that's being kicked off with GitHub Actions and it's using an Azure Machine Learning pipeline, which looks like this, to actually train our model. Now, what I could do is I could just add another step at the end of my pipeline to say, all right, now deploy it. Now we saw, you know, there are managed endpoints. It's very easy just to pick up a model and say, all right, deploy that to production. And we do want to use some of the power of Azure Machine Learning to do that. But we don't want to just throw this at the end of the training run to put this into production. What I want to do instead is continue using uh, Azure, sorry, continue using GitHub Actions or Azure DevOps or whatever I'm using for that. And there's a few reasons for this. Firstly, um, when we register a new model, you can trigger this. So you can say, oh, we have a new model that was registered based on the training run that we kicked off a while ago. Um, OK, let's start our continuous delivery process. Um, but we can deploy to a test environment, maybe. And that might just be as simple as hitting Azure Machine Learning um, using its API just to say, OK, that model that I just got, deploy it to a test environment um, or a staging environment. We can also run you know, integration tests. We can run load tests. All of these tests that we need to run that require us to actually deploy a model to a real kind of environment. Um, we can do uh, great things to control that rollout then. So because we're in a test environment, we can roll it out gradually. Uh, maybe we can roll it out to 10% of our users first and then see how that goes. Maybe we can put it behind a feature flag so that only a certain number of people get it or only a certain subset of customers get it. We could do A-B testing. We could do uh, shadow deployments, which means that we deploy it alongside, run all of our inputs through that new version and then just monitor the outputs for a while without actually deploying them to production just to make sure everything's okay and then put it live. So you can do a whole bunch of stuff, but the key here is that we're controlling our deployment the same way as we would with all of our other software. Now I've got the logo for GitHub Actions there as well. Azure DevOps actually has some incredibly powerful stuff around the continuous deployment phase. Um, but if you can use GitHub Actions for this, which is which is all I use, um, that's that's kind of the best way to go. So key here, control your model uh, rollout exactly the same way as you do with all of your traditional software. And the tools that are good for that are the tools that are built for you know, DevOps practices. Again, it's DevOps for machine learning. A couple of other little things I want to talk about just before we wrap up. Um, we've got about five minutes left on my, my timer, which doesn't actually match anything anyway. Um, I want to talk about this kind of complete pipeline. So what it might look like and some of the aspects of you know, running it in the real world. So this is our pipeline that we've, we've mentioned a few times. We have our data preparation, you know, pulls out certain columns, certain features, um, parses some of the data, maybe converts things like you know, a, an address to a latitude, longitude or a postcode or something that we can actually use in our training. So we do all this data preparation. Then we run our training using certain algorithms and certain hyperparameters and stuff like that. That might take quite a while. Um, and then at the end, we end up with this model, this predictive model. Now that, pr that process of doing the actual data prep training model registration, let's say we put that all in Azure Machine Learning. Now, obviously data prep, maybe you wanna use something else. Maybe you wanna use um, uh, some of, and I've just forgotten the name, which is embarrassing, but um, Synapse or um, 
the other one that I can't remember as well, data lake, something like that. Maybe you want to use some other process and you end up with this data um, that is ready to train already. Great, that's fine. Um, there's still going to be some data gathering or at least connecting to that data in your Azure Machine Learning pipeline. Then we train, we end up with a model. So all of that happens in Azure Machine Learning. Then when that model is registered, we kick off a GitHub action and you can do that using um, a, a trigger called repository dispatch. Happy to expand on that if anybody um, wants to kind of add a band as well. Um, so when that model gets registered, we have a new model that was run by an experiment um, that used a certain uh, version of data to train it and a certain code, a certain set of code to kind of create that model. It kicks off this GitHub action, which deploys it to a managed endpoint just by hitting the API. Um, and then maybe we monitor that for a while, make sure it's okay. And if we want to, we can promote that and maybe deploy it to an Azure, Azure uh, Kubernetes instance, or, uh, sorry, Azure Kubernetes service. Um, and again, we can just hit the API in Azure Machine Learning, but the control happens in GitHub Actions or one of those other tools. So we have this pipeline, right? We've written our code, we've run through this pipeline, it gets all the way to the end. And then we realize after a little while that our data um, or our predictive model is no longer performing. And this happens, right? We train on historical data potentially. And then after a while, that model gets a bit stale. So there's a few techniques for making sure that you have a retraining strategy and it's important to have a retraining strategy too. Um, it's, it's unlikely that you're going to deploy a predictive model that is going to continue to be successful for a long period of time. At some point you're going to need to refresh that. So common strategies are just doing it after a, after a period of time. So maybe every week you just do a retrain and make sure that you know your model is um, refreshed with the latest data or is updated with the newest data. Or maybe you have some kind of monitor on there to check for, you know, if we're getting this many failures in production or our um, click through rate of our predictive model output is low, then, you know, drops below a certain point, then we want to retrain. So one good example of that might be a predictive engine that will uh, do recommendations for a, for a store. So when you add five things to your cart, our predictive model might suggest a sixth thing based on what other people have bought and so on. If people, um, you want people to add that sixth thing on like, I don't know, 5% of the time, if that drops below 4%, then maybe it means that your data and your model needs retraining. So you can kick that off as well. Um, one of the really cool tools, um, and we saw little glimpses of it with monitor um, with the data sets as well, you might've seen that. Um, sorry, so the end of this, um, when that when that retraining occurs, we kind of run through that whole process again. But one of the really cool things is a is a, a um, feature called Data Drift. So the way this works is we have a training data set in Azure Machine Learning, and we use that to train our model. So we train it, we end up with this model registered, we deploy it to a managed instance, we monitor it and test it, it's okay, that we deploy it to production, right? When it's used in production, when it's actually doing its inferencing, we save those requests to an inference data set. It's much easier as well if you're doing batch um, inferencing as well. You can save them to the data set first and then do your, your inferencing as well. But what you end up with is you have this known training data set and this known production data set, the stuff you've really seen. Um, periodically, Azure Machine Learning can compare these two data sets. And if there's a statistically different a set of data, so a drift in a way that is meaningful to your environment, then it will automatically let you kick off a new training run. So this can be really, really handy for things like um, product uh, searches or something like that, where um, if people are getting some recommendations and, or sorry, they're putting in some data or some searches and getting recommendations, um, but then the searches they're putting in start to drift away from what you would expect based on what you trained on. Um, you can hit this threshold and automatically retrain that model. It's a really cool tool. Um, just to jump into it really briefly, because I realize I probably didn't see that. You can see here, data set monitors. Um, it's in preview at the moment, but this basically configures the monitor to, de to detect data drift between the training data set and your inferencing data. So really easy way to kind of um, trigger when you need to do a retrain. All right, so 
let's uh, the, the other scenario, of course, is if you decide that you need to uh, rebuild your training run or select some different rows or sorry, some different um, uh, features from your data or change your model or tune to your hyperparameters or something like that, which you would do by changing the code that's in your repo. In that case, GitHub Actions can pick up that change, refresh your pipeline in Azure Machine Learning and kick off a new training run, which again goes through and ends up in a with a training in production. So those are some of the scenarios and some of the things you might want to think about um, while you're doing it as well. And it's really worthwhile pointing out that this is just an example. So using Azure Machine Learning for, for this um, and producing something that is on a managed endpoint or Kubernetes is one way of doing it. Maybe your model needs to be embedded in a mobile app. So in that case, you're not going to use managed endpoints or Kubernetes probably. Um, you might want to grab that model file and do it and deploy that as, as part of your web application, sorry, your, your mobile application. So in that case, your deployment just works differently. You might want to be using Azure Cognitive Services to do some of this stuff. So maybe the image recognition stuff, um, you can have some customization based on products, uh, new products in your catalog like that. Now, the API is really good as well, and so you can trigger and queue new training runs and produce a new predictive model and do that all through Azure Cognitive Services API as well. But the process is the same. Um, the other important thing, though, is that Azure Pipelines and GitHub Actions can orchestrate literally anything. So anything that has an endpoint right, can be controlled or triggered or you know, integrated with Azure Pipelines or GitHub Actions. So working on those standard kind of DevOps tools to enable you to kind of orchestrate this whole process um, is a really good starting point. All right, final summary of the stuff I've talked about. All of your code and infrastructure and all of that stuff should be in source control for your machine learning projects. Um, your data should be these known, shared, and ideally versioned data sources so that everybody's working from the same data set when they run their training. Um, you can use Azure Machine Learning Pipelines for the training, but then use GitHub Actions and Azure Pipelines or something like that uh, to, to kind of orchestrate this whole process. So use the DevOps tools for the DevOps specific stuff and the Azure Machine Learning or the machine learning tools for the, the training stuff, the stuff that they're good at. Make sure you have retraining strategies um, and that really goes to the idea behind DevOps as well. You don't want a retraining to be spinning up a brand new project to reinvent the wheel. You want to be able to just kick off a new training run. And you can only do that if you've got a good process. And of course, for the delivery, just use standard DevOps good practices. Roll out gradually, use A-B testing, feature flags, and things like that. Now, uh, a bunch of resources that are available as well, and I'll put them on the next slide too, so you can see them there. Um, there's a, a blog series I uh, where I talked about and wrote about um, machine learning, or sorry, MLOps in general, um, if you want to check that out. Um, Microsoft Learn has some great stuff on Azure Machine Learning and on DevOps in general. And of course, if you want to learn about Azure Machine Learning, we always have great docs. Um, so those URLs can be handy for, for getting there. Great, well, I hope you learned something. Um, I think we've got a little bit of time for questions. So um, those links are there if you want and feel free to, to grab me for questions. So Damien, uh, quick yes. question. Um, GitHub versus Azure DevOps in terms <laughs> of the ML world. Do you have any comments or thoughts around when to use what? So um, I, I guess my answer, if you're just trying to decide between um, where the code lives, I would always veer towards uh, GitHub. Um, there's a few reasons for that, but um, the repos, I mean, a hosted repository is a hosted repository. It's the tooling around it. And GitHub has extremely strong, uh, strong tooling around um, the uh, around managing your code as well. There's also some awesome stuff around advanced security. So if you're using a version of a library that has a security vulnerability, GitHub can let you know that there's a security vulnerability and even submit a pull request to fix that, um, like to fix that versioning. Um, and that's something that doesn't really exist in Azure um, repos. Uh, GitHub Actions as well and Azure Pipelines will both do a great job of kind of orchestrating what you need. Um, but frankly, the, the um, engineering effort is going more towards GitHub Actions these days than Azure Pipelines. They're both fully supported, actively worked on. I think there's 200 odd um, engineers who are actually 
actively working on Azure DevOps, um, so it's not an abandoned product at all. Um, really, the choice is yours. They're both good products. Um, I tend to use GitHub more than more than uh, Azure DevOps these days. Thanks for that. Good insight. And another potential question that's come through. Uh, can you talk to best practices for data governance as you're building out your shared data sources? Um, sorry, can you just repeat that one again? I think I, I lost, just yep. lost the thread. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, best practices for data governance when you're trying to build out your shared data sources? That is a great question and probably a little bit outside my wheelhouse. Um, data governance. So um, I would consider that um, because obviously what you would want to be training your predictive models on would be realistic, as I mentioned, realistic production ready data. Um, that's not to say, so in general, you probably don't want your engineers just being able to trawl through customer data. I believe there are some um, efforts around um, anonymization of data that still maintains um, uh, the accuracy of, of that data or still maintains its usefulness, I guess. Um, but when it comes to, uh, those are still kind of research areas as well. I think when it comes to actually running real world training, um, you've got to run that on the data, which means that on, on the real data, which means that at least your pipelines and your training runs should have access to those data sets. But the accounts that your engineers are using, your data scientists are using, probably shouldn't have access to be able to just browse through that data. You could get stats, you could get, um, you know, uh, uh, ideas of what some of that data might look like but you don't want them kind of walking through production data. Um, how to do that, as I mentioned, probably slightly out of my wheelhouse, but I imagine the um, if you're using Azure for a lot of that stuff, that's simply a um, uh, an Azure user and permissions kind of thing. Um, you would just make sure the service accounts for your um, Azure machine learning are available to access or able to access that production data when they're doing that the predictions. Um, I'm not sure how much that helps, but yeah, it's a little bit outside, outside my area of expertise, I'm afraid. I think that's I think that's pretty good regardless. Um, good insights there. Um, I'm just checking the chat to see if there's any other questions coming through and <laughs> I don't I don't see any. We got a bit of a quiet uh, crowd today, which means I guess you must have explained yourself pretty well. <laughs> Damian. That's that's my uh, that's always my personal um, assumption even though I'm not sure how correct that is makes me feel better <laughs> um yeah so I think we can probably wrap it up there unless Sam um, jumps in a question last second yeah cool so I just make sure I've got that chat window thank you thank you everyone for joining today Right. Yeah, thank you, everybody. And um, feel free to reach out as well. Um, my details are, oh, sorry, feedback as well. Um, Peter, you mentioned um, uh, yeah. should let people know. Uh, feedback on the session as well. And you can always hit me up at um, Damo Visa on Twitter, D-A-M-O-V-I-S-A -S on Twitter or at Microsoft as well. Um, also works with any follow-up questions that you come up with later on. So thanks. Perfect.